Oh, how many people know the word of the Lord is good? I wish you can go ahead and serve the people the second offering. How many people brought your Bibles to church today? Hold them up, shake them around a little bit. That is awesome. Whether you're up, oh, some Bibles up in the cafe. That's awesome, man. Open that Bible to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And uh, we're going to talk about being salt and light today. Salt and light. And uh, you know what? The Lord wants us to go out of these four walls. The Lord wants us to be a light in this community that draws people to Jesus. And the Lord wants us to give a good taste to the community because of Jesus is good. Turn to the person next to you and say, Jesus is good. Let me tell you what was happening here in Matthew chapter 5. Last week, we talked about the Beatitudes, and we said that the key verse was Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. This is the key verse in, in understanding the entire passage, and it says this, Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So you have to have more righteousness than the scribes or Pharisees to get into the kingdom of heaven. Let me tell tell you what the Pharisees were doing, the scribes and the Pharisees. They were the religious leaders of the time. And the common people that were around on the Sermon of the Mount when Jesus was one, teaching this wonderful teaching, the common people were taught by the scribes and Pharisees that they weren't going to make it. They were taught literally that God created them to be fuel for the fires of hell. Can you imagine any pastor or any teacher telling somebody that they were created to go to hell? Man, I can't imagine that. But that is what religion does. Religion is exclusive. And and then Jesus, all of a sudden, listen, he wanted to shatter this concept. How many people know that Jesus is a game changer? He is a game changer. And in one word, man, he got the interest of the people. He said, you are going to be blessed. Now, I want to tell you what this word means. It means more than just being happy. I want you to be more than just happy. Being blessed means like you have the favor of God on your life. You have the blessings of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ and you can have a relationship with him. You can know him. What did Jesus say in the Beatitudes? He said this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And the common people were like, What? We're going to be called sons of God? We can be in relationship with Jesus? We can go to heaven? And that's exactly what the Lord was doing. He was turning the tables, and he was teaching the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Now, that word, it means like somebody who has already gone into heaven and the beatitudes blessed are the poor in spirit they describe the inward nature of the born again believer how many people know that God is concerned with what is on the inside of each and every one of us you need to be beautiful on the outside but you also need to be beautiful on the inside and those beatitudes describe the character and the nature that we are to have as born again believers now, we're going to move on to the similitudes. And what these are talking about, when you're saved and you're born again, Jesus is on the inside. How many people know it's going to show on the outside? Jesus is on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. He's doing a work in my heart. And now there's going to be an outward manifestation of the inward work of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in my life. And that outward manifestation is going to be that we are salt and we are light in the community. Can you give the Lord praise this morning? Come on, put your hands together. So these are referred to as the similitudes. An assembly is a figure of speech involving the comparison of one thing with another. In this case, salt and light and born-again believers. How many people know Jesus? He is our master teacher. Now, I will admit to you, many times when I read the Bible, sometimes I don't completely understand. It can be hard to understand spiritual truths. It can be abstract at times. But Jesus would use an earthly example like salt or light to describe a spiritual truth. He would say the sower went out to sow. There's wheat and then there's tares. He would use these examples to help people understand these spiritual truths. How many people are glad we have? have a master teacher in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now in verse 13 he said this, you're the salt of the earth. 
But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Why would Jesus use this example? Why would he be talking about salt? Let me just tell you a little bit about it. At the time of Jesus, salt was a very valuable commodity. It was a very valuable commodity. In fact, some Roman soldiers, they were paid in salt. Their wages were salt. And we get the word salary literally from that time when they paid Roman soldiers in salt. Because this is why it was so important, why it was an invaluable, a valuable commodity. The food during the time of Jesus was very simple. There wasn't much variety. It was very bland. They would eat lentils, dates, fruits, grains, nuts, and fish were very common at the time. You simply couldn't go to the International Mall in Tampa and hit Bay Street and go to every restaurant that is representing international cuisine from the four corners of the earth. There was no Texas barbecue. There was no sushi or lasagna or spaghetti or anything like that. And without salt, let me tell you something, there was no pleasure in eating food. Food. So it was a very valuable commodity at the time. How many people are glad that we have all kinds of salt now? It's very common. We got sea salt. We got iodized salt. We got kosher salt. Our cabinets are full of salt. Can you praise the Lord this morning? Put your hands together. The Lord is good. So it was a very valuable commodity. How many people know it brings out the flavor? Have you ever watched a cooking channel uh, and a cooking show? When they're cooking a dish, the salt is used to bring out the flavor. It's to bring out the flavor. Have you ever eaten any raw potatoes? Have you ever eaten any? There's a few of you out there. How many actually like raw potatoes? Look around. These are people that like raw potatoes. Wow. Praise the Lord for you guys. Praise the Lord for you guys. Have you ever eaten steak fries or waffle fries, curly cut fries, the little tiny steak and shake fries? Oh, checkers seasoned fries or crinkle cut fries, shoestring fries, and the gold standard of all fries, McDonald's fries. Man, if you take those raw potatoes, and you fry them up, and you salt them up, how many people know you got something pretty wonderful, one of the greatest foods that God has ever created on the face of the planet? Can you give the Lord praise? Man, I don't care what the doctors say about high blood pressure. Give me a big plate of salty fries. I'll just get to heaven a few days early. It's okay. Can you praise Jesus? Why are you talking about fries? There is a pattern to this. I was talking about potato chips last Sunday and fries this Sunday. Something to do with potatoes. No, it's all about Jesus. You see, our witness, our testimony, what's the point? Our witness and our testimony is to give people in the community a good taste. A good taste of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you, we cannot leave a bad taste in the mouth of unbelievers here in Newport Ritchie. We can't leave a bad taste in the mouth of people in Hudson or Tarpon Springs. we got to leave a good taste in the mouth of the people around this community, even to the ends of the earth. Turn to the person next to you this morning and say, you look salty today. Let's turn in our Bibles this morning to Psalm 34, verse 8. Psalm 34 and verse 8. Bring your Bibles to church, write in them. You're going to know the precious Word of God, Psalm 34 and verse 8. And let's all read Psalm 34 and verse 8 together. You there now? It says this, O taste and see that the Lord is mean. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. What, did I get that wrong? Let's do it again then. We'll try this one more time. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is condemning. Blessed is... Got it one more, one more time. We'll try it one more time. Oh, bless, taste and see that the Lord is... He points out your sin on Facebook. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. No, it's taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. 
How many people have tested the Lord and you have found out that he is good? Can you praise his name? Come on, second service. Oh, give him a praise offering. Oh, if you love Jesus this morning, give him a shout to the Lord today, a shout of victory and a shout of triumph because he is good. I can tell that he's left a good taste in each and every one of your mouths today because he is good. Now, if he's left a good taste in our mouths, then we are to leave a good taste in the mouth of the people here in our community. We cannot leave a bad taste. You're saying, how do we leave a bad taste in the mouth of the people in our community? Let me give you a couple of ways. Number one, don't be a bad tipper when you go out to eat. Don't be a bad tipper when you go out to eat. I've talked to a few wait waitresses. My wife was a waitress for a long time, and one of the days they don't like is Sunday afternoon. People of God, listen, at, at CCWC, waitresses should like Sunday afternoon because we are to be salt and light wherever we go. My wife and I, we went out to Carabas the other night and uh, got some spaghetti, some chicken brine. Oh, man, some good stuff in that restaurant. And uh, the, the hostess, she had arthritis, young lady, and she had on a brace on her arm. And we're like, you know what? We are going to pray for you. When we're going to pray for you right now. We prayed for that young lady, believed the Lord to bring healing to her, and we left a good tip. And we walked out of that. Everybody was smiling, and Jesus was glorified. We got to leave a good taste in the mouth of the community be a good tipper or don't tell them you come to Calvary Chapel Worship Center how are you going to leave a bad taste listen by displacing anger by displacing anger man I am under pressure I am there's pressure on every side I have pressure at work I get up in the morning there's pressure I come home there's pressure I got a 19-year-old and an 18-year-old. I'm trying to kick them out of the door. I got pressure, man. Four dogs. There's pressure. There's financial pressure. There's pressure on all sides. But I, I'm here to tell you, listen, I'm not going to let that pressure turn into anger, and then I'm not going to take that anger and give it to my wife when I get home. We got to leave a good taste in everybody around us. We're not going to give that anger to our kids. Maybe you'll go home and kick the dog. I don't know. No, don't do that. The animal rights activists will get on us. Don't even give your anger to the dog. This is what I do. I take my anger and I give it to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lord, help me through this anger. Help this anger to subside. In the name of Jesus. One of the ways we're going to leave a bad taste in the community is by being fake. Listen, don't talk in the King James Version. Don't ever do that. That's not good. Be a real, genuine, born-again believer. How are you going to be fake in the community? How are you going to offer something that's not real by being totally watered down? As time goes on, listen, people, we got to stir ourselves in the basic, fundamental things of our faith. And you got to stir yourself in prayer. I want every person in man, get into a prayer meeting. Pray when you're at home. Cry out to the Lord. Can you say amen? Cry out to the Lord and you're going to be genuine and real. Listen, when you get into the word of God, eat the word of God. Live on the word of God. You're going to be genuine and real. Love people and you're going to be genuine and real. We cannot be fake in the community. Now, this one really gets, I get a big kick out of this. It also, it, it's just hilarious. It's hilarious. You know how we're going to leave a bad taste in the community? By having this attitude in ourselves. Some Christians have this attitude. you got to get a kick out of this. Your sin is worse than my sin. Isn't that funny? It's hilarious because it's not true. How many people know that sin is sin in the eyes of God, period? In fact, the truth of the precious word of God is this. It only takes one sin without Jesus to wind up in hell. But the good news is, is that when we place our faith in Jesus, oh, he has 110% righteousness in his bank account. His bank account is completely full of righteousness. And when we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and Lord, he walks up to that heavenly ATM. He pulls out his Visa Platinum 
some card. I've never even seen one of those things. And he puts it in the ATM. He chooses account transfer, and he transfers 100% righteousness deposited into your account. Now you're 100%. Now you can go to heaven. Can you give the Lord praise? Come on, second service. Oh, he's worthy. He's holy. We got to leave a good taste. We got to leave a good taste. We can't be self-righteous people of God. Listen, salt makes people thirsty. It makes you thirsty. I went to the movies the other night, watched Spider-Man, and uh, I purchased a $15 three-ounce bag of popcorn. The popcorn was so salty, I had to go back to the concession stand and buy a $9 cup of ice with a little bit of Coke splashed over the top of it. You see, we are to make people thirsty for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in this community because the Lord says that if the believer loses his saltiness, he's good for nothing. People of God, we've got to give people a good taste in this community. Turn to your neighbor today and say, we're going to leave a good taste. Now listen, salt was also used to preserve So at the time of Christ, obviously, there was no refrigeration, and they would use salt to preserve food. Let me give you an example. Fish would be dried and salted. In fact, there's still dried, salted fish you can get today. It would be dried and salted. In the same way, I believe this with all of my heart, that God has CCWC in this community to be a restraining force for the Holy Spirit in our community. We are literally holding back evil by being born again and saved, being salt and light in this community. (laughs) Praise the Lord. I was talking with Pastor Johan yesterday, and he said, can you imagine the people's lives that have been changed? And we began to talk about it. And he said, because Pastor came to this community and started CCWC, can you imagine how many people have been changed? I'm here to tell you, oh, listen, it hasn't been 10 people. It hasn't been 25 people. It hasn't been 100 people. It hasn't been 1,000 people. I will tell you that there have been thousands and thousands of people that have been changed for the glory and honor of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through CCWC. And praise the Lord, that is changing this community. We are holding back evil. I will tell you, what is the answer to the addiction issue in our community? The answer is we got to get people born again and saved and discipled. And when we do, listen, we're being salt and light. We're holding back evil in the community. And this place is going to change one person at a time. Praise the Lord. Come on, second service. Put your hands together. We got to lead people to the Lord and we got to disciple them. Now, Jesus went on to say that he's the light of the world. Oh, man, I'm excited about this part. I'm excited about it because when he said, I'm the light of the world and he talks about light, he talks about salt and being light. We're moving on to light now. We're going to talk about being a light in the community. He referred, let me, I'm referring to John chapter 8, verse 12. Write that down. John chapter 8, verse 12. He said, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This was a messianic claim. It was a messianic claim. He was claiming to be God's only son. He was claiming to be equal with God. He is claiming to be the Messiah, the only one. Now, there's only two possibilities that can happen and take place when you claim to be the Messiah. Number one, either you are 100% crazy How many people have ever seen somebody else claim to be Messiah? They were crazy. I'm telling you. Uh, You know what? There's been many people over the years have said they were the Messiah. They were crazy. Or you're the Messiah. Now, I believe that Jesus, the carpenter's son, Jesus of Nazareth, I believe that he was and is the Messiah. This is part of one of seven I am statements all claiming to be the Messiah. He said, I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I am the door. I'm the resurrection and the life. How many people know there is going to be a resurrection one day? Can you give the Lord praise, old man? Oh, that's good news. 
my wife and I, we just buried uh, Debbie's mom just about a month ago. About a month ago. And as hard as that was, it was a very difficult time in our family's history, in our family's life. But as hard as that was, I know that I know, oh, there's going to be a resurrection. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the resurrection and the life. How many people believe it? One day we are going to get up out of that grave. This body is going to be raised again, incorruptible. We're going to be praying. It's going to be so awesome, man. We're going to have a glorified body. You can eat all the French fries you want and never gain one ounce. Praise the Lord. Come on. That is awesome. Praise the Lord. We're going to get that glorified body. He's the resurrection and the life. He's the good shepherd. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And he said this, before Abraham was, I am. He is God Almighty. I believe it with all of my heart. But there always are some skeptics around. There always are some skeptics around. There are many prophecies that were uh, written about Jesus. They were written about Messiah, what Messiah would do. And there are some skeptics that say, well, Jesus just read those prophecies. Didn't he have access to the scriptures? Couldn't he have read, just read Zechariah 9.9 9, and then found a donkey and rode it into Jerusalem and kind of, you know, tried to make this happen? Well, let me tell you something. That might be a prophecy that you could try to make happen. But can you try to make this happen? How many people know it's a fact that Jesus did not commit suicide? How do we know that? We know it because there are Roman historian. His name is Tacitus. There is a Jewish historian. His name was Josephus. They had nothing to do with Christianity. They were secular writers. And they confirm, history confirms, that Jesus was crucified. He was put to death under the reign of Tiberius Caesar, under the sentence of Pontius Pilate. So we know that he did not do that. We know that he didn't commit suicide. And besides the, that, how could you possibly crucify yourself? I'm here to tell you that Psalm 22 says that Jesus would be put to death, that Messiah would be put to death on a cross hundreds of years before it ever happened. I'm here to tell you he is the Messiah that fulfilled all of the prophecies. Do you want one more? Do you want another one? How can you predict the time of your death? If you read Daniel and chapter 9, his 70 weeks of years prediction predicted that Jesus would be executed, Messiah would be cut off in 33 AD. Can you predict the time of your death? I'm here to tell you, you can't do that. And Jesus fulfilled every messianic prophecy. It was a supernatural God thing. Give the Lord praise second service. Come on. He is the Messiah. Now, when you get saved, what happens is he's the light of the world. The light comes into you. Now you are a light. We're, we are born in darkness. We're born, thank you, Michael. That was awesome, man. Can I get another hallelujah? Praise God. Now that you're saved and you're born again, you're the light. The light comes into you. In verse 14, 514 says this, You're the light of the world. The city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp, put it under a basket or on a lamp, but uh, they put it on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. How many people know we are to be the light of of the world. I don't know if you were in church Thursday, but church was awesome Thursday. Angie was preaching and she said that we got to take this word, word not only to our Jerusalem, not only to our Samaria, but we got to take it to the ends of the earth. We are to take this light to the ends of the earth. Get busy people. Go on a mission trip. Get busy people. Serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Get on an outreach. When you walk out your door tomorrow morning, you're going to be on an outreach. Can and you give the Lord praise. Come on, second service. We are to take the light of the world to the ends of the earth. Now, very important to know, when you lit a lamp in the time of Christ, the most important thing was to keep it going. The most important thing was to keep it going. Why would that be true? 
Listen, it's very true because of this. An oil wick lamp at the time of Christ was hard to light. They didn't have a Zippo lighter. There were no Bic lighters. I like the lighters that got that long, you know, squiggly thing, you know, to light your grill with. They didn't have any of those butane lighters at the time of Christ. You had to get it going, and it was very hard to get going. People of God here, this is the moral of the story. Get your fire burning for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We talk, we sang that song, I want to burn for you today. Get that fire burning for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and then don't let it go out. Keep it burning. Can you praise Jesus? Keep it going. Man, a young man came up to me not too long ago said, Pastor Tony, I rededicated my life again. I said, I'm never going to do that. You could see his, his excitement just came down like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Listen, there might be some ups and downs in my life. I'm not perfect, but I am not going to backslide and fall away and then become on fire again and come back to church and then repeat the process, backslide, fall away, go away from church, come back a few months later, come back, get on fire again. No, people of God, we can't be like that. You don't need, I hope you don't rededicate your life in that sense ever again. You might come to the altar and renew and say, refresh me, Lord, but no backsliding at CCWC. Come on, people of God, you got to go forward in your relationship with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Keep that fire burning. Put it under a basket. No, I am going to let this light shine in this community. I am here to tell you, I am one person. I am not ashamed of my Jesus. I am not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Man, I have been picked apart on Facebook. I have been picked apart. I've heard it all. You believe that marriage is between one man and one woman? Yes, I do believe that with all of my heart. You believe that the Bible is infallible and it, there's no mistakes or contradictions in it? That's old-fashioned. That's backwards. Come on, that's for a, a century ago. Yes, I believe that with all of my heart. Thank you for the compliment. I am narrow-minded when it comes to the cross. Can you give the Lord praise today? I'm going to let this light shine. I'm not ashamed of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of the principles found in the Word of God. I'm here to tell you I am going to stand on them until I draw my last breath. Until I draw my last breath. Praise you, Jesus. Now, there are a lot of different meanings. There are a lot of different meanings in in being the light of the world. And you can say, yes, you know what? Light exposes darkness. Light exposes darkness. It does. But let me give you the main 98% meaning of this scripture. Have you ever seen a lighthouse? Have you ever seen a lighthouse? There's one in Daytona Beach, and, and uh, there's some still around. And we don't use them that much anymore because of GPS and Google Maps. And I think Google Maps is probably mapping the bottom of all the oceans. They know where every rock is now. But back in the day, waters were rough, and sailors would come in to a rough patch of water. They would put these lighthouses where the water was very rough, where there were treacherous jetties and rocks. And, you know, ships would crash, and these sailors would go down to the bottom, and uh, they were desperate, so they put a lighthouse, and these lighthouses would guide the way to, to a safe passage into uh, dry land again. And this is what Jesus is saying. We all need to be a lighthouse, each and every one of us. We need to be a lighthouse that marks the path to the way to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Think about our community. Think about our community. Oh, man, there is some treacherous waters out there. There's some brutal rocks that people are being broken up upon. There's a rock of addiction out there that is just wrecking our community. Oh, come on, people of God. You need to be a lighthouse that guides them the way around those rocks, around that addiction, and to a relationship with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How many lighthouses do we got in here this morning? Come on. Oh, praise the Lord. You got to be salt. You got to be light. You got to be salt. You got to be light. 
We're going to close with a word of prayer today. And I'm going to believe the Lord to touch you in a special way. If everybody in the sanctuary, if you would remain seated, I would really appreciate it. If you'd respect just a few moments that we have left. And uh, that would be wonderful. Whether you're upstairs or downstairs, the Lord has something special for you right now. He does. He has something special for you. And uh, before I pray for everyone, because I'm going to pray for everyone, believe the Lord to touch everyone in here, I want to give individuals a chance to receive Jesus as their personal Savior and Lord. Man, you've heard the good news today. Oh, man, you have. Listen, we're all going to die. That day is coming for each and every one of us. When it happens, we're going to be in front of God, whether you're saved or not. There's an appointment, and you have it. You're going to make it. One day we're going to be face to face, right in front of the throne. Angie was talking about that throne of lights. It can be a wonderful place or it could be a terrible place. When that happens, we're all going to stand in, and God Almighty is going to ask you a question. He is, why should I let you in? There's only one right answer. It isn't because, you know what, I went to Sunday school, made first Holy Communion, it isn't because I was baptized or I was a Baptist or I went to Calvary Chapel Worship Center. None of those things will get you into heaven. There's only one answer that will get you into heaven because I received Jesus as my personal Savior and Lord. I believed that he was the Son of God who died for me on the cross, paid the price for my sin, oh, my terrible sin, that he washed it all away with his blood. And I believe that he is God's son, that you rose him from the dead on the third day. I accepted him as my Lord and my Savior. Man, if you say that, you're going to go into heaven. If you don't say that, you're not going to heaven. You're going to miss heaven. Won't you come to Jesus today? Won't you make him your Savior and your Lord? Not going to embarrass anybody. This is just going to be between you and God. With every head bowed, every eye closed. All I'm going to ask you to do in just a moment, raise your hand, look up at me and say, Pastor Tony, pray with me. And you'll know your sins are forgiven. You'll know you're going to heaven. You can have that assurance. God bless you, man. Anybody else today, you'll say, Pastor Tony, pray with me. And you're going to be saved. We're going to pray in just a moment. Jesus is coming in, whether you're upstairs or downstairs. The Lord wants you to be saved. He wants you to know you're saved, you're born again. He wants you to know you're going to heaven. He wants you to know your sins are forgiven. He wants to give you a purpose. Anybody all else, you'll raise a hand and say, Pastor Tony, pray with me. And we're going to pray together and you're going to be saved. You know what, salvation workers, I want you to get with that one lady Lead her to Jesus. Seal the deal. Everybody else, let's raise a hand to the Lord today. Heavenly Father, you see our hearts and our hands. Lord, I pray, God, that we would be the salt. Oh, Lord, that we would leave such a good taste in the mouths of people. That's our responsibility, Lord. Your responsibility is to save them and change them. Lord, our, our responsibility is to be salt and light. Lord, let us lead people to Jesus. Let us be a lighthouse, a path through troubled waters. Straight to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Straight to healing, Lord. I pray that you would use all of us, Lord. I pray your anointing would be on every person here, Lord, that they would walk in the supernatural of God. I praise you for them and thank you for them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Can we give the Lord one more praise offering? <laughs>